All right, you guys, so we are here at the uh, living history of the Ringgold Gap Battle in the Civil War, which took place uh, on November 27th, 1863. Uh, as you can see right over here to my left, they're getting ready to fire off a cannon. Uh, they had a uh, gentleman here actually give us the history of the Ringgold Gap Battle as well um, and how it led up to the battle that took place here in Ringgold, uh, you know, starting out in Chattanooga and moved this way here. Uh, as well as the Battle of Chickamauga and how it all kind of collided together and, and formed uh, the gateway basically for uh, Sherman's march through, you know, the south and ultimately to Atlanta where he eventually burned it uh, all the way on his way to Savannah, Georgia. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and get over here and get ready to watch this cannon fire. Hope, hope that you guys enjoy the video. Make sure you guys hit that like button, subscribe to my channel. Also join me on my Facebook fan page as well where I post daily as well. Love you guys and talk to you guys again soon. And they sent part of Bragg's army to Vicksburg. Remember that night? Yeah, that was one of our Christmas Okay, so they weakened Bragg. So we ended up, uh, we ended up 77,000. Bragg had about 40, 4,000. So I'm going to read this and just put in the First, let's talk about Chattanooga. What makes Chattanooga so important? Uh, well, the Union had blockaded all the major ports. To get about the supplies coming in from England and other foreign countries. Uh, they had orders to take Pittsburgh and shut down the Mississippi River, which is a major transportation corridor for the Confederacy. Chattanooga was the fourth of the big town. Most of the uh, manufacturing uh, moved in the middle Georgia and middle Alabama, and all those supplies and all those men were pouring through Chattanooga. Uh, the terminus of the Western Atlantic, uh, Western Atlantic Railroad, uh, the railroad coming in from uh, Memphis and, and Alabama, the railroad going to Knoxville, all terminated what's called Chickamauga Station which is now where Tyner's located, okay? So number one, it was the rail center of the South. So let's shut that down. It's crippled the Confederacy. And number two, it's set at the two major gaps to the Appalachian map, and that was taken down in the, in the Georgia Tyler Mountain. It's like I-75 comes from Knoxville on north, on down I-75 to Atlanta. And you've got 24 coming from Nashville on north and on 59 into Alabama and so on. So that was two major, <coughs> what made Chattanooga so important? Supposedly, Mr. Lincoln, supposedly, I don't know, but you know, he, uh, he was a miracle in something, like, supposedly, so he had control of Chattanooga and win the war. So, so we go back to D.C. and we had the Battle of Stone's River. And I'm just going to read this and just, because I'm not really up on that, but I, I pulled it up last night. The successful Union campaign in Middle Tennessee in the summer of 1863 was a turning point in the Civil War. And it just, that's all right, mine goes off the wrong time too. <laughs> in just 11 days and very little fighting, the Army of the Cumberland moved the Confederate Army of Tennessee completely out of middle Tennessee. The campaign secured an agricultural productive region of the Union for the Union took the stage for the major battle around Chattanooga that fall and led to the crucial struggle for Atlanta following years. Now we all gone to Nashville up to the and seen all the big fields, all the big corn fields and so on and so forth. Let's go back to 1863. Those fans didn't start to didn't start move on Chattanooga in August. And that was set too well with, with uh, Lincoln and Secretary of Grant. They were going to go ahead and move. But, now think about this. He had a 77,000 man army. Probably 30 to 40 head of livestock. Mules, cavalry, and all that stuff. He wanted to wait for the crop to die. Right. Feed his army. Well, primarily now we think of corn, but think back then, a lot of wheat was growing in this area. The West hadn't opened up for all the wheat. 
the river, well, number one, the 21st Corps under Crittenden, crossed the Tennessee River at Battle Creek. Anybody know where Battle Creek is? Yeah, that's correct. South Pittsburgh. Yeah. Okay. He crossed that. Thomas crossed that bridge course on up to Sand Mountain, dropped on down into Trenton. Now, the bottom highway 136 from Trenton over into Valley McMorris Cove didn't exist at that time. He had to go on south of Trenton to what's known as everybody know where Rising Farm is? Johnson Crook. Or the old Johnson Crook Road that was the top of the mountain. And that's still a dirt road. How many have been down Johnson Crook? It's still an old dirt road just like it was during the war. And so the, uh, the cook went on down to uh, Stevenson, across the river at Stevenson. Across the mountains through what's called Winston's Gap. That's right near DeSoto Falls. Matter of fact, some of the Union campus to DeSoto Falls. We dropped off in a little community called Alpine, Georgia, which is southwest of Southern. So the one problem with that was there's about 30 miles difference between these three cores so they couldn't support each other. Okay. Well Bragg pulled one on, pulled one on road ground. He, let, he had to retreat out of Chattanooga because he had these two federal corps in his rear. They left stragglers in, in Chattanooga telling uh, Rosecrans that he's in full retreat to Rome and on towards Atlanta. And Rosecrans bit on Bragg just basically went to Lafayette because he knew he had massive reinforcements coming in. Long Street's Corps in Virginia, which you know, offloaded up here to the piece station. Uh, had troops coming in from Mississippi, and Buckner's Corps was coming in from Knox. Okay, so he's sitting there waiting on these reinforcements, unbeknownst to Rosecrans. He's probably still in full retreat. Uh, so basically, uh, Negley's division dropped off look that mountain into Macklemore's Cove, and you had the Battle of Davis Crossroads. Y'all familiar with that? On down in the cove, south of Chickamauga. Bragg had a route right where he wanted. There sent Bragg and the Fett with his whole army. There was, uh, uh, let me get straight here now. Thomas was coming in through Michael or Moore's Cove. He had a perfect situation. He could annihilate Thomas's four right there. But as usual, a lot of confusion with orders and so on and so forth. And Time the Confederates moved, the Federals didn't realize that they were in trouble with Bragg's whole army sitting across Pigeon Mountain in the thick. So they still battled back up on top of Lookout Mountain. And you had a little fight there on the Davis' crossroads. You go on south of Chickamauga, you go by the old park thing, if you remember that, and the crossroads is on the crossroads. Rosecrans made his headquarters on the morning of uh, September. <coughs> 16th at the Lord Creek, and I took him off if it was known as Crawford Springs at that time. And it was Gordon Plantation. The leads came in later. And he realized that he was in trouble. Reinforcements were coming in. He had an army scattered in the mountains of northwest Georgia. So he gave orders to concentrate on moving north to those two forts and concentrate on Lee and Gordon Mill. Okay, so those two corps started moving north. Of course, Thomas came out of uh, Michael Moore's Cove, not, not, not far south of uh, Chickamauga Crawfish Springs. But the cook had to go back up the top of Lookout Mountain, drop back off in the Trenton Valley, come down to Trenton Valley, <coughs> and cross Johnson's Crook in the Michael Moore's Cove to, to carry out Rosecrans' order. So Bragg, even though he missed the opportunity there in McLemore's Cove, he still had an opportunity. So he decided to move up the east side of Chickamauga Creek, thinking that the Federal Army's left wing was anchored at Lee and Gordon's Mill and stretched on south into the cove. So I go on up, get ahead of him, and turn him and push him back into the mountain. Okay, well, the elements of uh, 
Thomas is 14th Corps, showed up in Crawfish Springs, Georgia, or Chickamauga on the night of the 18th. He gave them orders to keep marching. Okay. So when Bragg made his turn, that Reed's Bridge and, and the little, little uh, Alexander's Bridge and Dalton Ford and Fifth Ford, they run into the Federal Resistance. So the Battle of Chickamauga was on. And I'm not going to go into that, but the Confederates won. But instead of pushing them into the mountain, they pushed them into Chattanooga. Well, Bragg decided to surround the Federals on the mountains, and put them under siege, and starve them out. Excuse me. As you know, there's a lot of dissension amongst the leaders of the Confederates because he did not follow up his opportunity. He should have went ahead and pressed the Federal Army. But his excuse was, we fought three days, my men are tired, we wore out. That's the same thing George Meade said to get Okay, but the Federal Army was in a rout. They were throwing down their weapons, trying to get into Chattanooga. Matter of fact, they say one of the worst uh, case did subordination is when Forrest chewed Bragg out for not following it up and told him, said, I'm leaving, I'll fight for you no more. So anyway, make a long story short, we finally won't get to the end of the Make a long story short, uh, Rosecrans was relieved of his command. George Thomas was put in charge. And Grant started moving towards Chattanooga from Vicksburg. Uh, we finally captured Brown's Ferry on the south of the, of the river where they could, they could cross on the north side of the river and so on and opened up the cracker line, which is, you know, they, they bridged forth, they started supplying that federal line that was nearly starting down to the news. So now we're going to get into the final missionary ridge. General Claiborne was to cover the right flank of the Confederate Army there at the tunnel, the railroad tunnel, and, and, and under Missionary Ridge. And basically, he went through the tunnel and he ended up at Chickamauga Station. And so Bragg decided to attack the flanks. Rosecrans decided to attack the flanks, and then that would weaken the center because it had to reinforce the flank, the flanks, okay? Now this is a little thing I learned about several years ago, the last step of that. There's a cemetery up in Red Bank. <coughs> called Sherman's Hideout. It was known as the Duck Pond Cemetery. It was known as the Chattanooga uh, Memorial Cemetery. Those friends, I mean, Sherman did his whole army. They could see Sherman moving from Lookout Mountain. He crossed the Tennessee River, the Grand Ferry, came up the far bank of the river, and they thought, well, he's, he's headed towards Knoxville to help relieve Knoxville. Okay. When he got there to that area around that cemetery, he, he was hidden from Missionary Ridge. He got out of sight. Okay. With this dissension in the Federal Army, uh, Jefferson Davis came down to try to sell them down. Okay. Well, Davis gets gone, and Brad, I'm going to get rid of these people giving me trouble. Long Street, you go to Knoxville. Right over leave Knoxville. Breckin Ridge, you go to so and so. And as a matter of fact, when the Federals attacked Missionary Ridge, Claiborne was loading his men on the train to go to Knoxville. Okay. So basically, Grant moved over those hills and crossed the Tennessee River again, built pontoon bridges and so on and so forth, and attacked that southern flank there at the railroad tunnel. Now for years and years, I was confused about Clavery Flag because it got Chickamauga Tunnel Hill on it, okay? Well, I thought it was Tunnel Hill, uh, tunnel hill over here. But it was Tunnel Hill on Missionary Ridge, is what it's signifying. And Claiborne did his job. He held them. But the center gave way. And so basically, you know, Claiborne retreated on through Jamesville, Alabama, and ended up at uh, 
at the gap over here, say the Confederate Army, and I found this on the internet. Uh, it's from Sam Watkins. It sort of gives you a overview of what they what they had to do. Let me find my notes. You might know where Cat Creek was. Your trainer. Okay. Battle of Cat Cat Creek, November 26, 1863. During the Creek Missionary Week, there were several war parties that have been forgotten. To all uh, actions that have been forgotten to all but the most serious students, one of those was the engagement at Camp Creek. Very little was ever recorded about it. It had been overshadowed by the fight of Ringo Gap on November 27. However, Sam Watkins did leave his version of the events, which I will leave you here. Battle Cap Creek. About dark, a small body of cavalry dashed ahead of us. Now, this is Sam Watkins talking. And, 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 uh, and captured and carried off one piece of artillery and Colonel. John F. House, General Manley's assistant, adjutant, uh, I can't talk this morning, I'm sorry. We will have to form a line of battle and drive them back. We quickly formed the, uh, we quickly formed the line, promptly shell off all those sides of bacon and sacks of hardtack that we had worried with and took all day long. You know, Bragg's army was starving. That's the same rocket. Watson told about eating rat. He didn't eat that rat. The last thing he saw was that rat going down that rat hole and saw his tails. And Ringo was budging with supplies over here. <laughs> okay. I thought this is the Our poor little handful of men being killed and wounded by scores. There is General George Manning, badly wounded and being carried to the rear. There is Moon, the Flutcher's division, killed in his tracks. We can't much longer hold our position. A mini ball passes through my Bible in my side pocket. All at once, we are ordered to open the rank. Here comes one piece of artillery from the Mississippi Battery bouncing 10 foot high over brush and logs and bending down little trees and saplings. Under whip and spurs, the horse was chomping at their bits and are nutty from head to foot. Now, quick, quick, look. The Yankees have discovered the battery and preparing to charge it. Remember horses and caissons to the rear. Number one shaft, shrapnel, loading fire. Fire, boom, boom, boom. I saw city fall badly wounded to the rear. I stopped firing to look at Sergeant Dole, how he handled the gun. At every discharge, it would bounce and turn the muzzle completely to the rear. When those old artillery soldiers would return it to its place, and they fired almost every 10 seconds. Fire men, our muskets roll and rattle, making music like the kettle of brass drum combined. They are checked. We see them fall back in the wood and night throws her mantle onto the scene. We fall back now, had to strip and wade Chickamauga Creek. It was up to our armpits and was cold as clarity. We had to carry our clothes across on the points of our bayonets. Fires had been kindled every few yards on the other side so we could soon get the one and two. And Clayton faced the same thing. We had to strip down. Go across that cold chicken market creek, I don't know what it points out right here, and get on the other side and warm up with all the fires and so on. And then basically he was ordered by Brian to hold Ringo Grass gas until the main Confederate Army and all the all the supplies for getting the Dalton and basically they went in the camp. That's it. So this started in Middle Tennessee, December. I don't know how 
the injuries that I've had. Because we're all you know that. Marching 18 miles a day. <coughs> so even though uh, and uh, if I ask me what if the ten things that if I said to me that that chicken them out to happen, well I just explained that to you, okay? And of course it did open that gate way to the south and turn his ten things. All the instruction that he, he did for his campaign, a lot of people don't realize, and I just realized it just within a couple of years ago, and I'm trying to get him to take the time to get back to the county. After that, I feel, so Sherman, I could start it north. Try to draw Sherman out of Atlanta. Try to find a good piece of ground, fable to Confederates, and fight it. And Sherman basically followed <coughs> up the railroad. And then 136 that goes from uh, I-75 to the back the old, old store, the old man, the old car, good right there. And it had a rear guard action, what's called Chips Gap. That's on the ridge where you drop off into Lafayette. The South Carolina troops had orders to hold them up and let's get some distance between them and us. And so I'm trying to the Georgia Civil War Commission to get an interpreter sign for it at the county. Uh, a lot of people don't know Sherman's in Walton County. And of course, naturally, he followed on the Jays Hill. Jays Hill decided, well, I'm going to Savannah, Thomas, and Kate here. Franklin. I'm going to tell Richard Ford's Confederate Army at Franklin, Tennessee. He's really good to be there at Nashville. Then, while we left, you can pick the old Mississippi and run the way all the way to Memphis. To the battle of it, and pick the surrender of the first station. I've got to ask a question. I've been doing all this, you know, I'm just going to be talking about it. I'm going to go to the rich man to keep his way. I had no thought about it. He's going to agree with me. I don't agree with myself. <laughs> We all know that war was a lot more than slavery. The expansion of slavery was an issue. Lincoln just wants to get home with the blacks. Because we wasn't going back up there and buying them, probably. Huh? That's because we wasn't going up there and buying them, probably. That's right. And of course, you know the largest import, uh, import for importation of slaves is called the United States. Those people got rich. They needed slaves to make the room. Yeah. They needed they got rich. They needed the northern uh, emancipation of slaves. Did they set them free? No. They sold them to the people in the south. You had a lot of... And what about, the, what about the tariff they put on our crops? And the tariff. And our cotton thing. and our corn and our wheat. Thing. You know, our, the largest country for cotton. We grew seven-eighths of the world's cotton. And most of that was going to England. Yes, so sir. They, so they had a tariff like 20% on gorgeous goods you import from foreign countries. And the South imported a lot from England. Machinery and farm implements and so on and so forth, so they decided to double that tariff. And it says that tariff was provided by 80% of the money went into the federal treasury. And it wasn't to free nobody. No. And most of that money was spent up north on railroads and projects and stuff, and none of it was coming back to the south. So, there's a war back. Just follow the dollar, like they say. 
vexation without representation, that's just like exactly the Boston right. Tea Party. And that's why Fort Sumter is so important. That's where they collected the parish. Right there. And Charleston is the richest city in the United States of America. We even had the New York draft uh, rights. So the Irish accused us of going to the Federal Army. The Irish get off the boat and don't do that position. that like button and subscribe to my channel also i did want to bring you guys a little bit of an update i am thinking of trying to design some shirts uh for the channel uh itself uh, so there's a a design that i'm thinking of the front uh and then on the back it does have um my social media uh platforms that i do help uh, share these videos with you guys uh so if you guys would like me to try to make any shirts for you guys um, just contact me through uh, Facebook or even in the comment section below uh, on this video uh, with that being said love you guys and talk to you guys again soon how are you guys so I'm here with my good friend what, what was your name Eric Fowler all right I'm here with Eric my name's Chris uh, we're gonna just kind of talk a little bit about how he be, how he got into reenactment or reenacting and why he did it uh, what what is his main goals of being a reenactor and uh, what is he trying to share as he goes out there and does these reenactments? Um, yeah, so when when did you get involved with reenactment? Uh, kind of goes way back. Uh, when I was a kid, I fell in love with it when my, my uncle gave me my first Civil War bullet that he was, he dug it. I was about four years old and something told me I was uh, reincarnated. I guess I take that to the Cherokee bloodline in my family. but. Uh, I've always loved history. I actually wanted to go be a teacher at one point in my lifetime, so uh, it came to be a reenactor. Civil War is what I like. Civil War is what I wanted to learn. I I'm from an area that uh, a lot of Civil War action happened in, and uh, just something about going to the battlefield when my mom and dad take me out there and seeing the monuments and seeing the reenactors walk around out there, that really enthused me to become what I am today. And how long have you been reenacting? Been reenacting since 06. 06. Full time reenactor, yes. Uh, if you had to choose uh, a, a location where you did some reenactment, what which one would you say would be the best? Home, a home battlefield for me would probably be the Battle of Resaca. Uh, I actually had family fight there back in the day. Uh, Resaca is not far down the road from us. 
uh, Rasak is a, a very good reenactment we have. Uh, probably that would hit home to me the best one around here, but we're actually going to try to make this one into the 160th anniversary and have the battle back out here like it used to be. So that'd be really cool. Yep. Um, and if you guys haven't noticed, I do have the Battle of Rasaka reenactment on my channel as well. Uh, it's getting close to 600 views now, so I do appreciate everybody uh, taking the time viewing that and showing the support of all the reenactors that go out there and give you guys a great show and all the great you know ven venues and all those that come out there and uh, supply the food, the clothing, and anything else that they go out there and provide. Um, but have you done any reenactments outside of Georgia? Yes, sir. Uh, I've been to Gettysburg. I've been to several in Alabama. I've been to some as farthest as south as uh, almost to the Florida line, to South Carolina. Uh, we used to, if they're having them, we try to get in attendance to go. We, we, we try to go, uh, me personally, I've gotten people into it. Uh, my lady, she I got her into collecting. I've gotten her into relic hunting. I've gotten her a dress that she comes out and dresses up with me. So not only is the men a big part of the reenacting world, but so is the women. You Absolutely. know, the people behind the cameras yeah. filming us, you know, we love that. So it, it, it all takes a lot of people to come yeah. together to make Absolutely. these small events. I, I do I do have to agree with that. Um, my, my beautiful wife is actually the one behind the camera right now. Uh, so when I go out here and I share these message, uh, a lot of times when you guys see me um, talking to reenactors or even walking around, um, I couldn't have done it without my beautiful wife. Uh, so, you know, she helps out a lot just like a wife with a reenactor, you know, she's always there for support. And I think that you know, having a wife is a great support system for all of us. Uh, it gets us to you know, get to better understand everything and also help us out there and grow. Um, but uh, have you ever been to the reenactment that's coming up in the first weekend of December out there at Fifth Burn? No, I have not. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually planning on going out there. Uh, so I hope that you guys do subscribe and follow me because um, I would love to be able to, this video is actually going to be probably released tonight. Perfect. Uh, so you guys will be able to catch a movie, movie popcorn, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I do appreciate you taking the time to come out yep. here and talk to me. Um, and and uh, just, uh, go ahead. Could, could I just key on one thing? This is sponsored by the local Sons of Confederate Veterans here in Catoosa County. Everything you see out here is what the local Patrick Claiborne camp. 2209. Would you like to say a message, sir? And helped us out. Show them your best. One of our members right here. One of the vet. One of the members of the camp. Uh, we're trying to save our history. Exactly Everybody's trying to erase our history and tell lies about it. We're trying to save our ancestry. Tr trying to save our history. I mean, I wasn't a part of what they done. I didn't do anything wrong to anyone, but yet they want to punish me or they want to erase what my ancestors did. Uh, my family was brought to America as indentured slaves from Ireland. England sent them here, sold them to an American. So, and we all, and the Irish came and built America. Actually, the Irish, the Germans, the Scottish, they came to America, and, and most of the Scottish Irish came to the South because they were mistreated in the North, and they didn't want to be in the. The North tried to force them into being in the Union Army and fighting, so they came to the South. They had a choice to fight, and they did. They fought with the South, and uh, well, we're just trying to preserve our history and our ancestry. I had a my great great grandfather died in the Civil War, and his brother, and I had a hundred men in the Civil War in, in this area with my last name fought, and 58 black men with my last name fought for the South. So I don't know why they, you know, there's a lot of mis givings or a lot of mistales in the history and that that's being taught now and uh, we're just trying to we just want our ancestry preserved preserved just like he has a patch right here of the stone mountain that's another one that we got to save i'm uh, a vet we, and we, i'm proud that my ancestors yeah. were vets but you know going back to the stone stone mountain uh if you guys don't really admire the history of the civil war that's fine but I do think it is a great piece of history. But the man that actually carved the uh, monument was actually a Korean War veteran. I got the privilege to meet one of his daughters. Uh, so we do need to preserve that here. It's been here for a long time. 
There's no reason why it should be changed um, for any particular moment because no matter what Robert E. Lee, Thomas, or Jefferson Davis, and Stonewall did in their past, we can still educate our, our youth today and give them the truth instead of filling it with lies. Um, but, you know, like everybody around here, we have a, we have a, we all have a love for our history, we have a love for our heritage, and there's no reason why we should be having taken away. Um, but I do appreciate you guys coming out and talking to me. Um, thank you again. We and don't, I, we don't ride horses, we ride motorcycles. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we're making ice cavalry. Thank you.